we stepped in with the FDIC and the Federal Reserve to intervene because um, I do believe the banking system in the United States is sound and resilient. Our banking system is sound and resilient with strong capital and liquidity. The banking system is sound and it's resilient. It's got strong capital and liquidity. The banking system is, is strong, it is sound, it is, it is uh, resilient, it's well capitalized. We will continue to closely monitor conditions in the banking system and are prepared to use all of our tools as needed to keep it safe and sound. Well, there you have it, folks. Nothing to worry about here. Everything is fine. We can all go back to sleep because, hey, the banking system is sound, it's strong, it's resilient, it's well capitalized. In fact, that is why the Fed intervened along with the Treasury and the FDIC. It's probably also why Janet Yellen called an emergency meeting of the FSOC today. That's the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Or maybe it is just that the Fed chair and former Fed chairs are actually contrarian indicators in and of themselves, and that when they tell you that there's nothing to worry about in the banking system, that in fact, that is the exact time that you should be worried. Keep in mind that this is the same Janet Yellen who told us back in 2017 that she didn't foresee another financial crisis in her lifetime. And Jerome Powell is the same Fed chair who was telling us in 2021 that inflation was a transitory phenomenon, but then who later went on to admit that now we know a lot more about how little we know about inflation. And of course, let's not forget the last financial crisis when former chair Ben Bernanke told us that the subprime crisis was isolated and would not spread. And if we take this view of things, this could help to explain why the IAT, that's an ETF of regional U.S. banks, is down over 30% month over month, while at the same time, both gold and silver are both up more than 10% in the same time period. And it could also help to explain why premiums on physical silver, the kind that you can hold on your hand, and gold as well, are on the rise. Now, speaking of physical silver. Want to win 500 Silver Eagle coins just like this guy? Yeah, this is Kevin. Hi, Kevin. This is Dr. Tyler Wall, CEO of SD Bullion. I'm calling to you to let you know that you won the SD Bullion giveaway of a monster box of 2022 Silver Eagle. Unbelievable. That is awesome. <laughs> so click the link below for your chance to win. And today's video is brought to us by ST Bullion, so you can check them out with the link down in the description if you're in the market for some physical gold and silver. And before we move on to this developing banking crisis and how this is going to eventually lead to huge inflationary problems here and some significant reductions in the purchasing power of the dollar, I do just want to comment on the rising premiums in the market when you see these large premiums on physical metal when you see the price rise over the spot price something you do have to keep in mind is the spot price is just the price of a paper futures contract and to show you that this isn't just the result of greedy bullion dealers cranking up the price right now the premiums on metal when you sell to sd bullion and i'm just using them as an example are over the spot price right now look at this SD Bullion is paying more than $5.50 over the spot price for 2023 American Silver Eagle coins. And it's not just the Eagles that are in short supply. They are also paying $2 over spot for maple leaves. And get this, they are paying over spot for 100 ounce silver bars, generic silver bars. Right now they're paying 40 cents per ounce over spot when you sell to them. This is unheard of traditionally. You know, normally, I mean, if you go to buy a 100-ounce bar, historically, you might get that at spot. Well, now, if you go to sell it to a dealer, you're going to get over spot. And it's not just in silver. Right now, they're also paying $40 over spot for gold. And when you see bullion dealers like SD Bullion or your local coin shop or anybody who has a set price at which they will buy metal back from you, over spot when the dealers are paying over spot that really shows you that investors are looking for the metals as a safe haven and they're not interested in paper derivatives like etfs or futures contracts they want to get their hands 
on the real physical metal. And it's almost like the physical market and the paper market are simply detaching. Eventually, the price of a paper futures contract for silver may have very little to do with the actual price of the physical metal itself. And investors, you know, as they see all of this uncertainty in the banking system, as they see the threat of rising inflation, they want to get assets that are outside of the financial system. And that's why premiums are rising. So it's not just when you buy the metal. Now, even when you sell physical metal, you're going to get overspot. That is not really a sign of a strong financial system. It's a sign that there's a lot of fear out there. And it's probably well-justified fear. Anybody who watched Wednesday's FOMC press conference with Fed Chair Jerome Powell, and that's where the clips at the beginning of this video are from, they're from that press conference, should be concerned about the state of the financial system. I mean, after watching that press conference, I came away with the distinct impression that inflation is going to be moving a lot higher. Now, the signs of this, they are all around us. One thing we can look at is the Fed balance sheet, which now in the past two weeks has moved up $391 billion. Now, if you want to go and find a point on the Fed balance sheet, a time when it was higher than it is today, you have to go back to October 19th. So what this means is that the Fed in the past two weeks has just undone five months of their quantitative tightening program of the reduction of their balance sheet. And a lot of this has to do with this bank term funding program or BTFP that the Fed has instituted following the collapse of SBB and Signature Bank. And basically this is just QE by another name. They are accepting treasuries and mortgage-backed securities at face value from these banks in exchange for loans as collateral for loans. But the thing is that the treasuries and the mortgage-backed securities are valued significantly less than their face value on the open market. So the Fed is basically taking these losses onto their own balance sheet. Now, Powell doesn't want to admit that this is QE. In fact, he reiterated that the Fed is committed to selling off their securities and letting these securities uh, expire and not repurchasing bonds as the bonds reach maturity. But I mean, I don't know about you, but when I look at this chart, uh, I have a hard time believing that because, like I said, I mean, the Fed in two weeks has now taken more assets onto its balance sheet, which, if you ask me, that's QE, the same amount of assets that it took them five months to sell down. So just think about that. And at the same press conference, Powell, of course, did announce a 25 basis point hike to the federal funds rate, but... If you listen to what he said, it really sounded like this banking crisis that we we're experiencing has changed his tune on rate hikes. Before SVB collapsed, that week actually, Powell was in congressional testimony and he told the Senate that interest rates were eventually going to need to go much higher than had originally been expected to fight inflation. But now that narrative has shifted. It seems like, you know, we may already be at the Fed pivot. Certainly the balance sheet seems to indicate that. And Powell's projections for future interest rates, as well as the language he used, seem to indicate that we may not be getting one at the next FOMC meeting. And it's very possible, uh, my interpretation of what I heard there is that this 25 basis point hike may very well have been the last rate hike in this cycle. And these problems, they are not relegated to the U.S. in Europe, we have Deutsche Bank. Their share price plummeted today by the market close. It did recover somewhat, but it's still down 23% month over month. And we've seen the credit default swaps on Deutsche Bank rising. We've seen credit default swaps on UBS rising also as they acquired Credit Suisse. So the European banking sector, CDS are credit default swaps. They're basically insurance against these institutions defaulting. So when you see them getting bid up, it means the risk of bank failure and the risk of default is rising. And at the same time, their AT1 bonds sold off sharply this morning. And that is following Credit Suisse is AT1 bondholders getting a write down of about $17.3 billion earlier in the week. So this contagion does appear to be spreading. And it's not just the banking contagion alone, though, in Europe. We also have the inflation problem remaining very persistent there. It's actually worse than in the U.S. The U.K.'s most recent inflation print, 1.1% month over month. 
that beat expectations of 0.6%, so almost double the expectations. The year-over-year -year inflation rate in the UK now 10.4%. And I'm not intimately familiar with how they calculate inflation over in the UK, but if it's anything like how they do it here, that 10.4% number probably significantly understates the actual increase in prices that UK citizens are experiencing. And so that is a very big problem. And that 1.1% move up month over month, I mean, just annualize that. And you can see that inflation there is rising drastically. And I think that we're probably going to be seeing that here in the US very soon, based on what we are seeing come out of the Fed. I mean, this is despite the assurances to the contrary by Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. But of course, as we know, he has gotten calls on inflation pretty consistently wrong so far. And I don't know, it's looking like inflation here may be just getting out of control soon with the Fed apparently pivoting on their QE, although, you know, they're not telling us that. And while they may pay lip service to the idea of fighting inflation, I'm pretty sure with these latest in interventions, the return to expanding their balance sheet, that the Fed has now tipped their hand when it comes to bailing out this system or sacrificing the dollar and letting inflation rage out of control, they are going to go down the route of inflation. And it makes sense. It's the politically expedient move. It is the easier move. Rather than face the pain of a debt default, rather than face the pain of a financial collapse, they will just simply continue to try to paper over these problems, which, you know, I mean, let's be honest, that's what they've been doing for more than a decade. So, I don't think it should come as any surprise that that is what we are seeing. But you have to understand that when you listen to these things like the Fed press conference or Janet Yellen in testimony or even just the mainstream media narrative surrounding these problems, there's never going to be an acknowledgement that the solution from the powers that be was not the right way to go. You know, they're never going to acknowledge that they made a mistake. They're always going to look for scapegoats. It's just like with inflation being blamed on, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin or on businesses that being greedy and raising their prices. Uh, you know, they never acknowledge that the real problem is related to fiscal and monetary policy. And that's why I have a little forecast for you here. And that is that as inflation begins to run out of control, as it begins to tick up again, as the dollar continues to decline in its purchasing power, I believe that we will see more and more stories about how inflation is good, about how if you have debts, they can be paid off with devalued currency, about how people's assets are increasing in value, you know, the wealth effect. Now, never mind that the increase in value of assets will be overshadowed by the decline in the purchasing power of the dollar, but I really believe that the narrative is going to be that things are fine all along, even as the system is burning down around us. Now, eventually, I do think that the mainstream will lose credibility, but when that time comes, it will be too late, and the dollar's purchasing power will have already evaporated. That's why I really think it's important to acquire hard assets, tangible inflation hedging assets like gold, silver, and it doesn't just have to be gold and silver. I mean, it could be fine art, ammo, vehicles, real estate, whatever you uh, want to hedge against inflation with. It's just that gold and silver are kind of a very compact form of wealth or a traditional way to hedge against inflation. But I do think it's an important time to be getting into hard assets because, like I said, by the time everybody realizes, the masses realize what's going on with inflation. It really will be too late. And, you know, I know that there's a lot of folks out there in the stacking community because I get comments to this extent pretty frequently about how they're waiting for a pullback in the price of the precious metals. And I mean, if you've been watching this channel for any length of time, you know that I like to acquire and stack metal when silver is in the red, when it's in a correction, because, you know, it's a good way to lower your dollar cost average. It's a good way to get the best deal for the metal. But I do have to say that right now, and this isn't financial advice, you know, I'm just sharing with you my thoughts, but if I had no physical gold or silver bullion, and I witnessed what was going on in the economy and in this banking system, I would run out and try to get my hands on some no matter what the price was. And I think that eventually that is what's going to happen because you have to understand, most people do not have any measurable amount of physical gold or silver. I mean, stackers are an extremely rare commodity among the populace. And some people probably have some jewelry, some gold, you know, a little bit of uh, heirloom stuff possibly. But the number of people who have any significant amount of real physical, tangible hard assets is very small. And that means that when it becomes clear 
what the end game for inflation is, that there are going to be a lot of unprepared people who are looking for a seat at the table. And it's like a game of musical chairs where, you know, there just aren't enough seats to sit in. And, you know, the physical metal is what you're going to want to have your hands on. And paper, silver, and gold just aren't going to cut it. I mean, if anybody saw that recent story where uh, J.P. Morgan had some contracts for nickel that was supposed to be nickel in a warehouse, turned out to just be bales of rocks. I think it was about uh, $1.3 million worth of nickel wound up just being stones in a warehouse. And it kind of makes you wonder how much of the warehoused gold and silver is real. You know, how much of it is just stones in a basket or molybdenum bars covered with a thin coating of precious metals. And that's why I think right now is just it's so important to be getting into hard assets. Again, not financial advice, just my thoughts on things. But with this level of uncertainty, I think it's incredibly important to have some assets without counterparty risk that can't just be destroyed or devalued or disappeared with the stroke of a pen or a keystroke on a terminal somewhere. And it's also why it's very important to take care of your other preparations. You know, the beans, bullets, and band-aids, all the basic stuff that you will need to survive if we go through a period of extended economic hardship because, you know, the size of the financial bubbles that have been inflated over the past couple of decades are unprecedented in history. And when they fall apart, when they pop, the economic pain, whether it be because the banking system collapses or because the Fed prints sufficient quantity of currency to prevent that collapse, either way, the outcome is going to be very challenging economically and uh, throughout society. And that means that, you know, there could be some major disruptions to our way of life, at least for a time period. You know, it's not going to be the end of the world. There have been currency collapses before. It's not a new thing. In fact, it's actually more of a uh, common occurrence than you might realize once you begin studying history. You realize that very few currency systems last for any significant period of time. And a lot of times they, you know, die the same way that the dollar eventually will likely die. And that is, uh, you know, fiat currencies get inflated away. They get printed to pay for unsustainable levels of government spending and uh, incredible levels of debt. And I think that that's kind of where we find ourselves. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, everybody. Just stay safe and happy stacking. And I will catch you next time. Smart Silver Stacker out.